in business, most people are horrible listeners. I have found that I learn a lot more by listening than talking. And I will tell you that many times this gives me a competitive advantage in negotiations because as people talk, they tend to talk too much and they tend to give themselves away. But all too often, people let their ego get in the way. And if we can suppress the ego a little bit and just be patient listeners, we'll learn a lot. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns, and this is where we share cutting edge strategies and acquiring leads and sales to acquire more customers for your business. But today is a real departure, Kasim. And I'm pretty excited to talk to this guy. It was actually on my to-do list to talk to him because I periodically check in with Greg Smith, who we'll introduce in here in just a second. But he's going to be talking not the digital marketing and advertising stuff. It's all the ethereal things. He's an investment banker. If we ever had investment banker on perpetual traffic, I don't think we ever have. And for good reason, Ralph, they're insufferable. <laughs> they're insufferable. I don't want to talk about his money and making money and all these other sorts of things, but it's not really what we're going to be talking about today. So, uh, Greg is actually about to release a book which relates back to everything that we're going to be talking about today. And directly how it relates to me and you is that you actually did a transaction with him not too long ago, which we can now talk about because it's now been announced. And Greg was the one who masterminded all that behind the scenes. And that's what these investment banker guys do. I didn't really realize like there were M&A advisors and investment bankers for you're probably running a business, you're running an agency. And maybe this whole world is just blind to you. And I think that is the rule rather than the exception, especially when I'm talking to a lot of my agency friends. Uh, so having Greg actually on here talking about that and also how it relates back to life with his new book and how it related to you uh, having a nice little, little exit here, uh, which we'll get into in just a few seconds is the subject of today's conversation. So if you're an agency owner, if you're a business owner, you're a CEO, even if you're a CMO or somebody who's thinking about starting a business, today is gonna be highly educational because we're gonna pull back the curtain a bit on this mysterious industry that not a lot of people know about and uh, Greg Smith knows a tremendous about it. So uh, Greg, a welcome to Perpetual traffic. Be, before we make your formal introduction, we always ask our guests for a, a little nugget, a little little sliver of brilliance that you can spring on the perpetual traffic listener. What would that be from you today? Well, thanks, and thanks for having me on. I think uh, what I would say is that my tip would be: in business, most people are horrible listeners. Uh, I have found that I learn a lot more by listening than talking. And I will tell you that many times this gives me a competitive advantage in negotiations because as people talk, they tend to talk too much and they talk, tend to give themselves away. But all too often, people let their ego get in the way. And if we can suppress the ego a little bit and just be patient listeners, we'll learn a lot. I think that's a good, healthy tip for everybody. I think it is. And I think... Uh... It's funny because when I was a sales and sales manager, I'm still kind of, I, I think of myself as a sales guy anyway, because now I actually am the sales guy for my agency. So uh, if you want to be the perpetual traffic sales guy, certainly contact us over at uh, tier11.com forward slash jobs. A little plug there, Cossum. Didn't even realize I was going to do that. But one of the keys to sales and to selling is not actually talking more than you're listening. Everyone thinks, oh, you need to be a great talker. Oh, he'll, she, she talks a lot. She must be a, she'd be a great salesperson when in fact, it's actually the exact opposite. Do you agree or disagree? Oh, I totally agree. In fact, Dale Carnegie wrote a book in 1934 called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And that is his single most important message is that uh, listening is the key to success. Yeah, for sure. And I think we wouldn't be doing the uh, the PT listener uh, as a service unless we actually mentioned an AI tool, which actually does do this. And we are we are actively testing this inside Tier 11 for our sales calls. It's called gong.io. And it actually tells you what your percentage of mm -hmm. listening versus talking is. So you can take Greg's advice here and start applying it to your sales calls and maybe to your team calls, whatever it happens to be. And uh, Kasim, I know you've had a little bit of experience with this. You've heard some good reviews about it. We're testing it. 
like I said, and I think it's definitely it's worthwhile. So a tip Greg's, and a tool. There you go. To Greg's point and his, his nugget, I'm on this article from Gong right now uh, talking about talk to listen ratio, and they analyzed however many calls and found – uh, the, the analysis revealed the highest converting talk to listen ratio on B2B sales calls is approximately 43 to 57. So you're talking 43% of the time and you're listening 57% of the time, which is interesting because when you zoom out, what they found is the average talk to listen ratio is 72 to 28. Mm. So most salespeople need to peel themselves way back. Or or you can see where the advantage is because Carnegie's message is that the more people talk to you, the more confidence they build in you mm -hmm. because they now have a listener and they're talking to the listener. And it's just, I found this so many times that the more I let people talk, the more they're building confidence in me and what we're going to do and what, what we're going to, uh, and what really what we're all about. Uh, it, it basically uh, enables them to self-affirm that the relationship is worthwhile the more they talk. And I'll let them talk all day. Yeah. Well, today you're going to be talking on perpetual traffic and we're going to be listening. So the rules are a little bit reversed here because we want to tap into all your knowledge and also talk about a little bit about this transaction. And maybe if you're thinking about selling your company, this is a show to listen to. Like you're going to get some free nuggets of advice. I don't know how deep we can go down that rabbit hole for legal reasons, but I'm going to push it as much as possible here between Kasim and Greg. And we're going to get into that as well as tell you exactly a little bit more about who Greg is right after this quick break. And we're back with Perpetual Traffic, and uh, this might be the most special episode I've ever recorded, at the risk of sounding a little sappy. Um, Greg, our guest today, is my business mentor and best friend of 19 years. I met him when I was 19 years old, and uh, he has shepherded me through life in a myriad of ways, uh, including in business and then also just being something of a big brother. So uh, it's kind of cool to be able to just sit here, Greg, and look you in the eye and ask you a bunch of questions. For, for people that don't know who you are, I'm going to do my best to make you blush. Um, Greg is the most accomplished person I know personally. Uh, he's helped build three ultra high net worth private family fortunes. Uh, he built the largest privately owned auto finance company in the United States. He's bought and sold 30 to 40 banks across the Midwest and Southwest. Uh, he's currently an investment banker. Um, the chairman of Banco Advisors has done massive deals, bought and sold an airline two times um, and, and had to run it for almost a decade. He's also the, the father of two amazing, amazing girls uh, who now have their own kiddos, grandfather of four, Greg, the, the aces, Ava, Cooper, Everett, Sebastian. And um, I could not be where I am today without Greg Smith. So Greg, I really appreciate you being here. Kazim, it's a pleasure. Of course, you're always very flattering and it's always my pleasure to just reciprocate and say it's been a pleasure to know you and and see who you become. And I can't wait to see what's in your future. It's great. Yeah. Now that we've effectively patted each other on the backs, um, Greg wrote a book that we're going to be pushing pretty hard on the podcast. Uh, it launches July 11. Greg, do you mind me asking just for the, what's the slug line on the book? Why would somebody want to drop what they're doing and go grab it? I think uh, people that will read this book are looking for um, maybe some ideas on how to take the next step, how to find courage, how to build a little confidence, 
basically in finding what are the keys to unlocking challenging situations and problems that they have. And what I've done is uh, developed 15 chapters, which uh, go through in somewhat granular detail through different industries, aviation, banking, chemical, finance, and my life starting out at age seven, uh, which is an interesting story and the challenges there too. And at the end of each chapter, uh, we provide a key, which might be uh, a single word. It could be fear, empathy. Um, it could be innovation, happiness. Uh, and then we build around that key and talk about why it's relevant uh, to our lives. And uh, at the end, we bring this to a conclusion and explain why each of these steps and each of these doors we unlock, which is our journey, uh, really becomes our destination. And the title of the book is No Locked Doors, Master right. the Keys to Transform Problems into Possibilities. Yep. And that book will be everywhere books are sold July 11th. Check it out on Amazon, uh, ebook, hard copy, softback. And we'll probably be drawn on some of the principles today as we talk about what is not your largest deal, but definitely your most important, uh, which was which was my exit. Yeah. Forget about those airlines. <laughs> those 30 or 40 banks. Right. Who cares? Greg, help me uh, change. exit my little agency, which I got to be honest with you, it's hysterical when you think about it. Like I've got one of the best, one of the best investment bankers in the world helping me sell, you know, uh, a small marketing agency. It's like bringing a bazooka to your, your friend's backyard water gun fight. It was just unfair. Uh, but I'm, I'm forever grateful. For those of you that don't know, I sold Solutions 8 in October 2022 to a, uh, a MarTech company. I'm still the CEO of the company, still very actively involved. Um, but I, I, I took a, a modest eight-figure exit and um, couldn't be happier with the deal, couldn't be happier with the team that we've partnered with since then. And I could not, and this is real, this is true, I could not have done this deal without Greg. I had 40 unsolicited offers, which is an interesting place to be. And here's what's interesting is I'm pretty sure 39 of them were scams. <laughs> and that's the problem. If you don't have somebody like Greg looking over your shoulder, you know, I had 40 unsolicited offers and some of them looked, you know, big, massive ivory tower uh, family offices or small investment banking firms or other agencies. And everybody's promising you that the world and, you know, the multiples feel like outlandish and you just don't know what to look at, how to navigate it, what to do. And Greg, uh, you know, mother hand me throughout the entire process. And it was a arduous eight month, Greg, nine month. How long did that deal take? Yeah, it was nearly a year. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, what I'd like to do today is just talk to our listeners about if you want to sell a business, and I think most people want to sell a business, um, the pitfalls, the risks, how to prepare, what to think about. Uh, and then, you know, maybe uh, how to find yourself your own Greg Smith. Uh, how does that sound as an itinerary, fellas? Yeah, I'm good with it. I think it's great. I think we we have never talked about this before. I know we we said that in the intro, but like this, if, if you have never entered this world, I think what Greg is going to talk about here today is going to kind of blow your mind because there's possibilities for every business to make a successful exit. I mean, you have to have the fundamentals. You have to have a good business model. You have to have all these other sorts of things. But a lot of people just don't even realize that this is a potential possibility. And just to, it, and probably don't know any investment bankers. I know I didn't before the journey that I went on two or three years ago. Um, and I think this is an opportunity to, to really learn. And it has nothing to do with digital marketing here today, uh, aside from thinking about your business and thinking about ways in which, you know, is this something that you want to do? And then obviously it comes back to a lot of the principles that will tie back into the book. So I, I, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, more. So Greg, obviously my deal was n not your average project. And I think that's because it was smaller and, and not the sort of thing that would generally land on your radar. Um, how did it differ from what you're used to working on? And how might that be relevant to our listener? Like if, if there is something of a matrix you can put together as far as like, you know, your, your average deal, what people are looking for, um, just so people can kind of get a sense as to where they land in the spectrum. I think that'd be really helpful. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, and maybe to give my answer some context, uh, 
because uh, I'm unlike most investment bankers, I have run businesses. So I didn't start out my career or get into investment banking early on. I'm essentially a recovering commercial banker and recovering CPA and only two years. That's the minimum amount of time to get a license. I'm no longer practicing in CPA. That was a long, long time ago. But my background before investment banking is helping build uh, uh, fortunes, if you will, within uh, private families and private family offices and across several different industries, which we talked about a little bit earlier and I expect we'll talk about again. So having run a business, I've been in your shoes and having built businesses and bought businesses inside of private family offices, I have a pretty deep understanding of what it's like to run a business and preparing a business for sale is a whole nother subject. Uh, we might want to talk about that another time. I think what was unique about your transaction is we did not uh, prepare you for a competitive process. We did not prepare a selling memorandum. We did not have a book. We did not go out and identify prospective buyers, suitors, bidders, and run a competitive auction. What occurred in your situation was about the time you were thinking that it might be a good time to sell, you find yourself in late 2021 and through much of 2022 with just a flurry of solicitations. And let's face it, you're out there, you're on the internet, you're an identity, and you're easily findable in the agency business. And so people did. And so as you and I started looking at these offers and looking at where was your income, where was your EBITDA, how could we create an optimal picture as if we were preparing your company for sale while we were actually in the process of getting solicitations. It was like trying to change the tires on a Mercedes Benz going down the highway at 80 miles an hour. There was just a lot going on. And of course, you had to uh, hold your team together. A transaction might occur. It might not. So this was, this was very, very confidential. And uh, along the way, we started doing due diligence on these offers and solicitations and presentations and people wanting your time and people wanting to get you into an agreement that might be exclusive and take you off the market so they could have a first peak and on and on and on and on and on. And I think it would be very easy for young, uh, inexperienced business owners to be tempted to take one of those. Sounds great. Dollars are phenomenal, great exit, smooth exit, but there's so much due diligence to be done on a buyer before you engage. And that's the normal selling process is once we have a company that's going to sell and be ready to be sold and have an appropriate selling document and memorandum, we do the heavy lifting first to vet the buyers, find the buyers. And we it's, it's global in most cases. And of course, Buyers may be strategic or they may be financial or they may be both. But the strategic buyers are typically the ones that will pay the most because as a bolt on or as part of maybe something they already own or to build their presence in a particular industry vertical, they will pay more than a financial uh, buyer who's simply looking for a return on investment. So we had to sort all those different solicitations out. And there was one investment banker with a firm I was familiar with in India. And I had just been in India a year or two ago. And when I travel, I try and build relationships with people in my business. So if they have a buy side mandate, they'll think of me in the US. And this gentleman called and he said, I, I have a buy side mandate for an agency. Uh, and um, uh, if, you, if you have any ideas about a US based agency, here's kind of our criteria for EBITDA, or if you will, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, that's EBITDA and some revenue targets, uh, we'd be keenly interested. My questions back to him were, how well-funded is the company, the buyer? Can they close a deal? What is their motivation? And we started talking about their motivation was to implement their AI or artificial intelligence into the agency vertical. So what I was able to determine uh, through doing my own due diligence, was that they were more than well-funded. They were backed by the largest multi-billion dollar private equity firm in the world. And they had chosen this vertical agencies to expand and grow and build on and had started putting large amounts of money into the buyer. 
So as Cosm said, we sorted through a lot of prospective solicitations and found this one worth taking a look at. So we got under a confidentiality agreement that was appropriate and also non-circumvention agreements. And then we had a confidential exchange of information. And then all of a sudden they were in Cosm's boardroom. And that's when we were able to look them in the eye and start sorting things out. So this was a different kind of process. Normally, as I said, it's a competitive auction process where we go out and identify the buyers. In this case, we had kind of a mad rush over an eight or nine month period of time before we really got into the deep due diligence. Greg, there's a, uh, a rule that you've offered me. And it's funny because I've heard you say this for the last 20 years. You know, as I'm watching you from the sidelines doing the deals that you do, I've heard you say this thing over and over and over again. And then I never really paid much attention. I always thought it was kind of hyperbole or, you know, part of the dance. And, and then we get into our deal, the deal that I'm doing, and, and it became uh, very relevant. Do you mind sharing with the listeners what that rule is? Uh, well... <laughs> I guess there's a lot of rules, but uh, one, of course, is uh, always have a competitive process so you know you're getting the highest and best price and the best terms. I, I was thinking more specifically of, of every deal dies three times. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's, it's true. At least in my experience, uh, people blow up, egos get in the way, somebody gets their head out of joint on something. Something is discovered in due diligence and misunderstood. And, uh, and that can happen. And that, and that certainly happened in, in this case, in, in, in the case of the sale of Solutions 8. And yet we never leave the table. That's another rule. We never leave the table. If somebody else wants to leave the table, that's fine. Usually they'll come back. That might be the most important rule that I learned because I was convinced a couple of times that, oh, that deal's done. Let's move on. Let's find another buyer. Let's figure something else out. And you, you coached me down every time. And it was interesting to see just how consistent it was. And, and it was almost like you were telling the future. And I know that's not the case. You just have so much experience because it did feel like that. It feel like the deal died a couple of times before we were finally able to get it over the finish line. So that's a, a, a writer downer for our listeners. If you think you're going to sell, if you think you're going to walk through that process, assume that your deal is going to die multiple times. And when I say die, I mean, you think it's truly done. It's broken. You're divorced. They're never coming back. You're never going to hear from them again. Assume that. But like Greg said, I'm not saying don't mitigate risk. Don't look for alternatives as long as it's appropriate with whatever contract you've assigned. Never leave the table. And Greg, you, you've taught me that and you've beat it into me. And I don't, I don't even know that I fully integrated it just yet because the entrepreneur's instinct is, you know, flip the table, move around, go, go try to solve the other problems. But this is an instance where you just sit there calmly and quietly and you're like, hey, I'm still here if you ever want to come back. And it's interesting well, to see how consistent that was. Yeah, I think also, Cosm, that uh, it's human nature for people to say, is the deal dead? Why did it die? It must be price. Maybe it was too much. I don't want to go through this again. Mm -hmm. I think I'll counter and uh, I'll come back. And, and as a seller, I'll, I'll say, well, you know, it, we, need to, we need to finish our conversation. We need to continue the process. And I'm willing to lower my price. And it's like, <laughs> that is the worst thing you can do. You never counter your own counter. You never counter your own offer. And it may not be price at all. It might be just the deal has to take a rest because something else got in the way. Maybe the buyer's funding fell apart. Maybe the buyer really, really wants to buy your company, but their funding source is uh, gone tentative. And that could be for reasons unrelated to the buyer. We see this in, in financial transactions, in financial transactions of commercial banks all the time, where the deal just needs to take a rest because maybe the buyer is now under examination by the control of the currency. So the buyer can't go out and conclude an acquisition of another bank because they're in examination, but the, but the seller doesn't know that. So sometimes we just have to let things play out. And I think, as I told you a number of times, let the deal come back to you. Don't call them. Don't email. Don't get anxious. Just wait. This deal will come back to you. 
And meanwhile, you were still getting other offers and other solicitations and all this crazy stuff in the background, which is noise and highly disruptive. Well, I want to talk a little bit about that. And Ralph, stop me if I'm bogarting the call. Um, but I think one of the, the other things that really took me by surprise was the fact that price isn't the most important thing. We had uh, quite a few offers that maybe came in at higher prices or alluded to higher prices. But I was um, surprised to learn how important terms are because I, I potentially could have sold that agency for, you know, I mean, 15 figures, let's say. But then it's, oh, I'll pay you a dollar a day for the rest of eternity until we get there. And um, negotiating terms became maybe more important than negotiating the price because the terms are really what dictate what you walk away with and how protected you are uh, and, and the real value of the deal. There's a lot of people that have made massive exits on paper, but you can't eat paper. And um, that was an important lesson. And I'm curious, Greg, from your perspective, now that you've worked with an agency, how different was selling an agency to selling, say, an airline or a biotech company or uh, a bank? Uh, Kazan, that's an interesting question because I would say the principles that we apply in selling a business are pretty broad across all industries. So I can't say that um, selling your agency was different than selling a bank or a chemical company. The process is typically the same. And I, as I said earlier, it's typically a competitive process after we've prepared the company for sale and we know why the seller is selling. And we know what those reasons are so that we can hit their objectives and know what their expectations are, both on a pre-tax and a post-tax basis. But those are principles that apply across uh, pretty much any industry. And I would add to your comment about terms that price typically is the big focus. This is what I want. This is what I think my company is worth. Or sometimes we hear, this is what I need. Mm. Well, what I need and what the company is worth may be worlds apart. And if we aren't engaged with the seller on the same strategic vision, starting with value, we have to disengage early on because a lot of people have high expectations about value and it's just not in the real world. And, and this goes on up to boards of directors and oftentimes very smart people that are delusional about the value of their business. But apart from value, I want to come back to the other element, which is terms and conditions. And there's many forms of currency when you sell a business. One form of currency might be your very own currency, which is you're selling it on a note hmm. where you're providing the financing to the buyer. It happens as a portion of the proceeds transaction. A seller may actually finance part of the proceeds for the transaction itself. But cash, of course, is a nice currency. Equity in the buyer is another currency. Earnouts going into the future as a portion of the sale proceeds is a currency. Uh, other forms of compensation and agreements could be forms of the currency. So there's all different types and kinds of currencies. And what are those values today versus what are the value of those currencies in the future? If you're taking equity in the buyer who's coming along, you could get a fantastic outcome because if you're taking equity, first of all, it's tax deferred until you take that equity to cash. And secondly, if it's equity in a publicly traded company, you might get a double or a triple before you liquidate. And that's a double or a triple just sitting there resting on your hands, letting the buyer's yeah. equity ascend into the market and, and let that value along with the value of your business, which is now a part of the bigger business, create that value. We sold a banking company for... Um, about 9 million shares of Wells Fargo stock in the late 90s. And not too many years later, that stock, which was trading at $36 a share, was trading at $72 a share <laughs> on 9 million shares. So the, so the seller who had the 9 million shares, all of that lift from $36 to $72, there was no tax on it. Can you imagine how much money you'd have to have to pay the taxes and have left over to be able to make that kind of money? This was all pre-tax money. 
So 36 mm. bucks, no tax, on up to 72 bucks, no tax. Pretty sweet. But of course, then 2008 came along and Wells Fargo stock was trading at $8. <clears throat> so when do you there sell? Is, there is a flip side. Well, the, the, the point there is that if you trade into a publicly held security, you have liquidity anytime you want it. So, you know, you have choice. Well, so that's actually funny that you just said that, Greg, because I think choice is the key in chapter six. Uh, mm -hmm. Since I've read your book a couple of times, Greg offers uh, 15 chapters, each with 15 keys. And um, it's an interesting thing to make sure that you always stay focused on the fact that you do have those choices and, and, and then how you use them. You know, it's, it's, that's chess in life. It's three-dimensional chess in a lot of ways. Ralph, I think I interrupted you. Yeah, so we're here with Greg Smith, and uh, we're talking in terms of how to sell a business. Um, we get back from the break, a couple of things I do want to ask you. And obviously, the, the big question for everyone is always like, how do I value my business? That's like, how, how much can I get for it? Everybody wants to know that. So we're going to give you some keys to determining that value right after this quick break. All right, we are back with Greg Smith and uh, just a couple of definitions on terms here. So uh, EBITDA is one that a, a lot of people talk about. You define that, but then family offices, strategic buyers, financial buyers, like what are the difference? Private equity groups, private growth companies, like there's lots of different people that are out there that can potentially do a deal with you. Can you maybe just define some of those terms and then we can get into how the, all that relates back to potentially business owner listening to the show here. How the hell do I potentially, uh, you know, value my business and what could it sell for? So maybe just do some term definitions first from sure. your perspective. Okay. Let me do that. Uh, EBITDA first of all is a mnemonic for earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And why that's important is because it en enables us to look at any company in any industry and normalize its cash flow. So EBITDA is really all about cash flow. Depreciation is not a cash expense. Amortization is not a cash expense. Those are just bookkeeping entries to give life to a fixed asset. Interest is variable. A company may be financed and have interest expense or it may have no debt. It has no interest expense. So when we start talking about EBITDA, we put all companies up on a level playing field in terms of what sort of cash flow do they generate. Recall that cash flow or EBITDA is different than net income. Reported net income is after all that stuff, depreciation, amortization, interest expense, and taxes. So if you have a limited liability company, if that's your business is a limited liability company, you have no taxes. Why is that? Because a limited liability company is a pass-through entity and its taxable income floats up onto the income of the owner or owners. And so it pays no taxes. Well, if we compare a limited liability company to a regular C corporation that pays taxes, we end up with an apple and a grapefruit because they both have EBITDA, cash flow, but one of them has got to pay taxes. The other one is passing its income on to somebody else. So we can't compare net income to EBITDA. We like to look at companies on an EBITDA basis. And then uh, in terms of uh, family offices, that reference we've made earlier today, uh, that's just simply uh, uh, what we should imagine uh, for a family, many times multi-generational, that owns a business or businesses, and maybe they've had exits from those businesses and they've accumulated cash, and now they're taking that cash because they're more mature 
and they're trying to find ways to retain their net worth. So they're taking that cash and they're investing it in different types of things. And at this juncture, I might just make the distinction for your listeners between venture and private equity. Family offices and individuals may invest in a company that's very, very early in its stage. That would be considered venture or in some cases an adventure. And companies at that stage that are bringing money in before they maybe have no revenue, maybe they're just an idea or maybe they have a product or maybe they're going to get something to the market, um, will in, enable investors to invest. And that might be uh, family offices investing. That might be considered a seed round, S-E-E-D. These are like small seeds that go into the ground and we're going to grow something. So that's a seed round, and that is considered venture money. Once we have a company that actually is selling something and has revenue, and hopefully soon earnings or maybe EBITDA, cash flow, then that company, if it needs more capital, will move forward into what's called a Series A or Series B round of capital. Now we have a more mature company. We have a company that we can compare its margins to other companies in the same industry. And that takes us to valuation. So in valuation, we're typically looking at what similar companies are trading at or valued at. Pretty easy to do with publicly traded companies. We just go to the market and we look for the comparables and we find them. No different than looking at what houses are selling at these days or commercial buildings are selling at these days. But if it's a privately owned company, their EBITDA and their revenue is typically unknown. So it may require investigation. It may require uh, exploration in terms of getting that kind of information. Uh, Sometimes we're able to seek through private subscriptions or public subscriptions, um, information and data mining or data fields, if you will. PitchBook is one source. There are others that uh, try and assemble information of the earnings and profits of privately owned companies. And then we get into Thirdly, rules of thumb. So what is the rule of thumb for the sale of a business? It varies on the industry. Uh, I talked to a company just yesterday that has sales or revenue of $37 million. They're a 14-year-old company, and they got way behind the curve on their technology. Their technology was not cloud-based. In their industry, all their competitors have cloud-based technology. This is a service company that provides a service. And uh, I talked to the owners, which include private individuals, founders, also a few private equity firms and a few venture firms. And I found out that what they thought their company was worth was a multiple of six. But six what? Their EBITDA is negative. Three million. Three million. I'll pay them. I'll pay them six x whatever negative number that is, Greg. <laughs> yeah, six x yeah, a know. negative number is still a negative number. Yeah, but, but they, I mean they can pay me, right? That's well, yeah, exactly. So this, so yeah, take it off their hands. So in this case, uh, their their uh, uh, evaluation of their company in the marketplace is six x on revenue, or thirty seven or thirty eight million of revenue. They're thinking they have a two hundred twenty million dollar company. I don't know if it's worth two hundred twenty million dollars. But it might be to a strategic buyer, not to a financial buyer. And interestingly enough, I got a call from another one of my contacts overseas who was looking for such a company, a service company of this particular type and kind. And the buyer has a balance sheet backed by one and a half billion of cash on their balance sheet. This is a strategic buyer who's making investments in this space and is looking for a solid U.S. foothold company with extraordinary management, extraordinary technology to become a platform. Do you think they're going to be concerned about 3 million of minus EBITDA or 3 million of positive EBITDA or break even with the kind of cash they have? If the management team is right, they can bolt that on to some other investments that they've already made and let that management team start start the very next day with a $100 million company. I think they'll figure it out. We'll find out. 
Mm. So that's a little breakdown on, you know, some of the terminology that we use in the industry and, and hopefully that's helpful to your listeners. So strategic versus financial. Yeah. Just, let's, listener, just explain that because in that particular scenario, I'd be like, wow, that, that company's worth nothing. Well, not necessarily yeah, because it's a different type of buyer that you're talking to. So explain the difference. Yeah. If I uh, own, for example, a small private charter company in California that's in the airline business and provides charter airline service, and I'm just giving you a hypothetical, I'm making this up. Uh, there's a whole wide range of people that might want to own that company. Uh, there's probably a, a third category besides strategic and financial, and that might be ego, because it might be considered kind of fancy to, to own a, uh, a charter airline company or own a baseball team. Uh, in my view, baseball teams are for trading, not for keeping. And I would say the same thing about airlines, having bought and sold one twice. Uh, but there are some companies that are certainly worth keeping and keeping for the long run. And sometimes financial buyers just want to park money and get a return on their investment. And they see a nice, stable history of earnings, potentially some growth. They may or may not want to put more capital into the company for the growth, but they're not bolting it on to anything. They're not appending it to another existing business. A strategic buyer typically is already in the business. He may be somewhere in that vertical, and maybe he's on the retail end, but he wants to be on the wholesale end to reduce his costs. Or maybe he's on the wholesale end, but he doesn't like getting beat up on price. So he wants to go direct to consumer and put his product into the marketplace. So he's building his vertical. Uh, that's an I illustration of a, of a strategic. And, and, and strategics might be expanding either vertically or horizontally uh, or both. Uh, and we will typically in a competitive process talk to both. Uh, but we often find the strategic buyer will will be the uh, the bigger price and the better terms. And strategic buyers can come to us directly or they can come to us through uh, other uh, firms like private equity firms that uh, have made investments in a particular vertical and now they want to expand that vertical. That was the case of, um, of uh, a company I re recently sold were a private equity firm who had made a heavy investment in another company. It wasn't going that well, but they needed to bolt on and, and uh, solve their problems by getting a better team of management and better technology, similar to the illustration I gave at the beginning of my comments. Greg dumbed it down for me really well when we were shopping. Um, I have a Google Ads agency. We only work with Google Ads. And so, Greg, the way that you... Uh, simplified the strategic buyer concept for me was um, the financial buyer was going to come basically buy my income and they were going to be looking at it the same way somebody looks at property almost like, oh, this property yields a seven cap. So I'm going to get 7% on my money. Uh, a strategic buyer would be somebody who sells Facebook ads. I've got a hundred clients running Google ads, but I don't run Facebook. They've got a hundred other clients running Facebook ads, but they don't run Google. If they were to buy me, now they get all of my income, but they also get to sell all 100 of their Facebook clients my Google ad services, and they get to sell all 100 of my Google clients their Facebook services. So it's a one plus one equals five, depend, you know, depending on how those things will end up uh, multiplying and manifesting. And that was, I guess, the easiest way for, my, for me to wrap my head around it. Uh, and I think we ultimately found a semi-strategic buyer is about the way that they approached it. I don't know if they priced us that way, but that's really what they were looking for at the end of the day. Yeah, they were. It was uh, cross sales first. And then I think secondly, to implement their AI technology across all of their investments. So you had, they had multiple reasons to make an investment in you. And you were unique because you were mostly singularly focused on uh, Google ads. Mm-hmm. And it's an interesting transaction because it's a strategic buyer backed by a financial buyer in this particular case. Exactly. Like the money, and we, we find this a lot, actually, and a lot of the strategics already have a relationship with a financial, whether it's a private equity group or, you know, in this case, you know, really large one. But that's common, too. So you sort of have to figure out, like, what the motivation is. And, you know, your example of, you know, the company that was actually losing money. Well, most people are like, oh, you don't really have a business. Well, no. If they have something, then asset, something of value that a strategic desires, whether it's vertical, horizontal, in this case, maybe management team expertise, whatever it happens to be, all of a sudden, 
you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. So I think these are all like, these are all new terms. I think for a lot of people that are, they're just thinking about this. And if this is, this isn't the first time that you've heard of, of all of this, I think it's, uh, it, it's very instructive to get your take on it. I think you're very, you're very good at articulating complex concepts, which I think relates directly to the book and how the book sort of takes a lot of your experience, which is a tremendous amount. Like we've never had somebody on this show that's like, you know, bought owned two airlines and bought and sold 20 or 30 banks and you know did this little deal with solutions eight the point is is like that type of expertise and experience boiled down into a book is pretty valuable for our listeners here so maybe we can uh, Kasim, i know you've already read it so maybe we can talk about the book a bit and how it sort of relates back to some of these concepts that we've talked about here and and buying and selling businesses I, so I've read it a couple of times now. I was one of Greg's early proofreaders. And what I really appreciate in any book that I read is, is um, actionable advice. I actually get a little pissy about the way books are being written now. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but there's this bad habit of, of people taking what should be a blog and turning it into a book. So they can say they wrote the book and they can publish the book and they can get speaking gigs and they can call themselves an author. And it's not a book. It's one okay idea that's been inflated across 20 different chapters and th that being such a uh pernicious and ongoing trend has jaded me so when i encounter a book that's actually dense that really does have a lot to offer i'm always really pleasantly surprised and i'm, I'm glad to say that greg did that uh by a multiple i mean greg if you wanted to the way that people write books now you have 15 books here Every one of the chapters that you wrote could have been expanded into its own book because the stories are so interesting and so intriguing. And that's, I think, the thing that's coolest for me is, and hopefully this doesn't end up being a backhanded compliment, um, there's not a lot of difference between big business and small business. You know, I always thought, especially as a small business owner, that when you get to the big business, everybody's sophisticated, educated, they make logical decisions, they only think with their mind, they have nothing but analysts and, you know, charts and graphs and data. And then, you know, it's all, it's all uh, scripted and there are rules that everybody follows and everybody knows the rules. And it, it felt like the exact opposite. There's so much that nobody knows and none of, none of the rules are outlined and it's, it's, it's wildly creative and very emotional. And there are people like, you know, making hundred million dollar decisions that are doing so because they're mad or they get upset or they're, they're just getting pissy. And, and maybe it actually gets more volatile, not less volatile as you get bigger. And as the numbers get bigger, the volatility increases. And, and, and part of that obviously is because the risk increases. Um, and the way that you, at the end of every chapter, this is my favorite part, is, you know, the book is called No Locked Doors, and it's about finding the keys. And, and these are keys that you don't necessarily, they're not obvious. And that's, that's the, I know it sounds overly simplistic when I state it, but the keys to problems are never obvious. Otherwise, they wouldn't be problems, right? If the key was obvious, it wouldn't be a problem. It's just a matter now of going and, and getting the key. But, you know, what you've done, Greg, here has helped identify how to find the keys, where to look for them, where they might be, how to create them if they don't already exist. And you end every single chapter with a key. And, and the keys end up being really actionable, things that you can kind of integrate and work on. And I'm curious, now that you and I are talking, I know which chapter my favorite is. I'm curious which one is yours. Like, if you were to highlight one of the keys, one of the chapters for the listeners, if you were to give one of those away for free, which one would it be? Uh, they're all precious to me, but I would say one of the most rewarding was, uh, my first go at this particular airline. And I might say that we changed the names of companies and people and places in the book because to protect we, the guilty. Well, we maybe protect the innocent. We, we want, we're very, we're very sensitive to, to everybody. Um, but as you all know, um, I would say, as, your, as most of your listeners would know, the aviation business is very volatile. Jet fuel prices go up, jet fuel prices go down, COVID, people can't travel, people have money, they are traveling. Uh, this particular company was a non-union 
charter airline. So it did not sell seats. You could not buy a seat on this plane. It sold its planes through a charter process of awarding them to wholesale travel tour operators. So a wholesale travel tour operator puts together a package, which is a plane ticket, a car rental, and a room. And when this company was acquired, it was acquired as a five-year-old company with one asset, an engine, and a bank account, and a fairly sizable bank account. And everything else was leased. And it was doing about $50 million a year in sales and $1 or $2 million in EBITDA, or cash flow, as we talked about before. When the company was acquired, shortly after it was acquired, and there were two founders that had put this together, the president was a revered, highly respected person and a key guy to the transaction, died of failed angioplast surgery. And so the other partner, who was basically an operations kind of a guy, not a necessarily a financial guy, was left with this company and reporting now to the private family that had acquired the company. And I represented the private family. So I said to the private family, you know, it's a horrible situation. The founder, co-founder, and namesake of the company had unexpectedly died. And this was shortly after a flight. He had been a pilot as well. No one knew about the blockage in his heart. So I said, we'll get you the best airline people in the world and we'll plug this hole and we'll fix it and we'll move forward. And they said, you know, you've worked for us for 10 or 12 years now and we think you understand our business practices and expectations. You're going to go run it. And so I didn't want to be the face of, of a non-airline guy stepping into an airline. Uh, first of all, no one would believe it. So the co-founder and I got together and joined each other, if you will, as the co-executive officers for the company. And it worked out great, except after a little bit of time, we got into just a hell of a storm with competitors that uh, are scheduled carriers. And we started experimenting a little bit with scheduled airlines. And also the economy had turned. As I said, it's a very volatile industry. And our margins started to compress, and we were slowly turning our profitable airline into negative EBITDA. So you can't run a company with negative EBITDA unless your investors are willing to put more money in and cover the negative EBITDA or banks or lenders. And the uh, owners uh, who had me on a mission at that juncture really to save, not necessarily build the company said, you better fix it. Uh, so to answer your question, on the one hand, I ended up laying off one third of a 750 people workforce. And I said, this is like the worst day of my life. I went to zero compensation. I asked everybody that stayed on to take a 30% pay cut and we cut a third of the workforce. But we also put together a profit sharing plan. And we said, we will turn this company around. We will fix it. And we will put a healthy percentage of our net income into profit sharing for the employees, 25%. 25% of the income of the company to the employees. Find another company in America where they're taking 25% of net income and putting it into employees who own how much stock? None. But they're valued resources. That company came out of that economic time. We were able to hire every single person back, build the workforce up to 750, take the $50 million of revenue, turn it into $250 million of revenue, and build the EBITDA to about $24 million of EBITDA. So wonderful recovery. Best day of my life was to bring those people back. And the union came in, of course, they pounced all over the airline and they wanted to force union and oust management and a lot of stories I could tell you about that. Union never got a favorable vote. They'd open those votes up in a box in Washington, D.C. It was always no, no, and no. Alpha, Teamsters, machinists, no, no, and no. And uh, we sold the company. It was a wonderful transaction. Unfortunately, the buyers... 
uh, decided they wanted to take the company into scheduled air service and compete with the major airlines across America. And that was a very unfortunate incident, but uh, uh, they did not recover. They put the company into bankruptcy. Those employees were all out of work for six months. But guess what? They had tens of millions of dollars in their profit sharing accounts. So no child missed a meal. Every kid had shoes. Everybody went to school. They suffered through for the six months. The company was then reformatted and restarted. And once again, they all got to come back to work. It's a great story. The company is now on its ninth owner. (laughs) That's one that just doesn't quit. It doesn't quit. And I think it's the best company in the airline business since Orville and Wilbur took off from Kitty Hawk. We had a lot of fun with it. I love that story. That is amazing. <laughs> Just the fact that you, 25% of net operating income goes back to the employees. Like that, that's outstanding. I, I've never heard of that. Yeah. It's I've a, heard of profit sharing, but I mean, that's crazy. It's a, it's a, it's a union company now. So that, that doesn't ah, exist, okay. but, but right. Uh, when we had it, it was, uh, everybody was pulling on the same rope every day. I mean, if there was gum in the seats, uh, the pilots would clean it up. I mean, the flight attendants, they would back, back their, break their back to help a, a, a passenger with any need that they might have. It was really fun to fly in that company. And I think it still is today. A lot of that spirit from way back then with those people uh, is still around there. Too. Yeah. And I think, I think people... I talk about this with my leadership team a lot is people would an overemphasis on just pure compensation as a motivator. Like if you're, if you are transparent with your people and you tell them that you actually need their help in order to build something great or to turn something around or to fight a common cause or, you know, achieve a specific vision. It's amazing how that unto itself, take the monetary side out of it. And obviously there was an incentive there, but that unto itself is like a pure gold mm. lesson, mm-hmm. you know, and it, and for anybody who's listening right now, who is experiencing a challenging time, like be transparent with your teams and uh, help allow them to help you get to where you want to go. It's not a single venture here. It's not like you're alone as the CEO, you can enlist the help of others and they rally around the cause. And it's amazing what can happen and what people will do when they rally around a common cause that is has a purpose and obviously is there's a self-interest there as well, but also in the interest of building something big or great or meaningful. And I think that's a great lesson. Yeah. Ralph, a big part of it, at least at my end of it, was to be transparent with the employees. Employees often know more about what's going on at the company than the executives. They're, they're in it. They feel it. They know it. They breathe it. They smell it. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, and they're, and they're worried about it and they're concerned about sure. it. It's their paycheck. It's how they pay for the groceries. My very first day there, uh, and this was, um, shortly after the uh, co-founder had passed away was not well received by the surviving co-founder and the management of the company. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to need an office. And uh, I was showing a locked broom closet with a drain floor and a mop pail in the corner and some rusted shelving. And that was the message to me to, you know, take a hike and and get out. But what they really needed wasn't my airline expertise. I had none. What they needed was my finance and financial background and having run a number of other companies in other industries. And so I just decided that day, that morning, to get myself into a pair of jeans and some steel-toed boots. And within two hours, I was on the runway tossing bags with the baggage handlers. Then I went to the kitchen in the afternoon and got cleaned up, and I cooked meals for three or four hours. At 1 o'clock in the morning, when these flights were coming back from Mexico, Guadalajara, Mexico City, uh, Huatuco, Zihuatanejo, leisure flights, vacations, I'd meet the crews at one and two o'clock in the morning when the planes were coming back and tell them who I was, tell them how much they were appreciated. No one had ever done that, but I was new and I had to, you know, I had to find a way. I had to find a way, Ralph, to connect with people. 
after that, I was, you know, kind of accepted. Maybe he could be an airline guy. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is just a sampling of, I think, uh, 14 more, maybe we've already touched on two of them, but at least 13 to 14 more lessons from the book. Uh, and I know it's, it's coming out July 11th, as we had said before, how can people get in touch with you? What's the best way to connect with Greg Smith? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so I'm pretty easy to find Gregory J. Smith on LinkedIn, uh, Banco Advisors, B-A-N-C-O. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm all over LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, we'll leave links in the show notes for that, for all listeners. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on Perpetual Traffic. I have a feeling like we'll want you to come back on and maybe uh, espouse a few more of the lessons from the book and other things. Uh, Greg is a great guy to know, obviously. Just listening to this show here, definitely check out his LinkedIn. Uh, check out what he does. Um, and of course, if you like what you heard here, you can always leave a positive review. Kasim, we love those. We do love uh, those. Yeah, wherever you listen to your your podcast, whether it's on Spotify, whether it's on iHeartRadio, iTunes, like we're everywhere now. Uh, we're there's nowhere you can't miss us. But um, please do that and go back and listen to previous episodes as well. Let us know what we can do better over at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash better. Don't send anonymous messages saying Ralph was right. Oh, we didn't even mention that one. We should. Oh, we're we're going to have to talk about that. In yeah. the Did next Ralph episode. send those? Yeah, it probably yeah. was Ralph, Greg. It was probably Ralph's EA. That's my <laughs> expectation. We got, we got an anonymous survey response from someone that just said Ralph is right. It's, it's fishy to me. It's very fishy. Yeah. Well, it's an amazing what you can do with it. You, know, it you pay somebody 20 fishy? bucks. You know? Yeah, it's a, it's a little yeah, fishy. fishy. That's right. Fishy. And if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see like the largest fish I've, I think I've ever seen like over a doorway that was caught, what, 200 feet below the surface of Lake Michigan. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's yeah. 220 feet. Uh, and that is on our YouTube channel, which you should really check out. We always leave links in the show notes for that. It is perpetual traffic. It's not perpetual traffic podcast. We have questions about that. We're working on it. But we will leave links in the show notes. Just look at for uh, Kasim and my smiling faces on there in the profile pic. All the resources we mentioned here will be in the show notes over at perpetualtraffic.com. Make sure you follow me over on LinkedIn, Ralph Burns, and then Kasim on Twitter at Kasim Aslam. On behalf of my awesome co-host and on behalf of our awesome guest, Greg Smith, Kasim, peace. Thank <laughs> you.